Hey robot makers, hope you're having a good day so far. So do you want to build your own robot that can play tic-tac-toe using a Raspberry Pi Pico, an ST7735 screen and a bunch of servos? Then this is the show for you. So let's dive, let's dive straight in. My name's Kevin, come with me as we build robots and bring them to life with code and have a whole load of fun along the way. Cool, let's get over to the, uh, the keynote and let's get started, shall we? This is so much fun, I can't tell you. You've got to build one of these, it's a, it's, it's a blast. So what we're going to be looking at today is taking a look at the tic-tac-toe playing robot. So um, this is based on a project that I'll show you a bit more about uh, in a moment or two that's called Tico. So I've called this one Pico Tico because the original one was based on um, an Arduino Nano. So I'm using instead the, uh, the Raspberry Pi Pico and MicroPython. So let's have a look what it can do, how it works, translating some of the code between Arduino and MicroPython, um, having a quick look at inverse kinematics because this uses it and it's the first time I've, uh, I've looked at that, and uh, some of the projects that this is based on. So the Tico robot was actually based on another project as well, so we'll have a look at that. And then, excuse me, we'll have a look at where we can go next with this. Don't drink Coke before you start a live stream. Um, so what can the Pico Tico do? So... It can draw the game board, it can draw out the uh, the tic-tac-toe, knots and crosses board that you might be familiar with. Uh, it can play the game of tic-tac-toe, it can write the little X's and draw the little circles, um, and it can play against a human player. Um, currently, the code is random, so it'll just pick a random free space and it will draw when it's its turn next. However, we're going to have a look at how we can build in some AI to make this so that it cannot lose. It can draw or it can win every single time. Um, so it can erase the board as well. I'm going to show you um, some some previously um, made footage of this working. Mine doesn't quite do this at the moment, but we'll have a look at that. We'll have a look at that and why. Um, it can display messages on the little screen. So this is really cool. I didn't realize you could draw color graphics with the Raspberry Pi Pico. I thought because of the you know limited memory, but because it uses an SPI device, it can just send commands to it and update the screen. So we can draw really nice color graphics on the screen. And I've really spent wasted loads of time doing that on this little little robot so we can have a look at that too and it has so much potential there are so many different directions we can go with this i'm already thinking about maybe a a post-it note robot where it just draws out little post-it notes and so on and uh, the other thing is well if i go over here i have this uh, huge notice board over here um and when I'm working, I'll update, I'll put the calendar on there, I might put some notes on there. I could just have two great big sort of arms that uh, move around the board and uh, draw that out every single time I use it. So that'd be really cool. So let's have a look at this. How does it actually work? So from a hardware point of view, it's pretty straightforward. It has two servos that control the, uh, the pen, the sort of puck that moves around the canvas. Uh, it has one servo that lifts it up so that it can the pen can go up and down. So it's pivoted, uh, it's pivoted around this uh, this area just here. Uh, it has a colour screen, it's got this uh, ST7735 screen, P uh, SPI screen, SPI or SPI, uh, and this version of the robot is powered by a Raspberry Pi Pico, so it's very cheap to put together. So wiring this together, um, it's a bit of a headache if, you, if you're not going to solder everything, if you're just going to put jumper wires uh, on everything, it can be a bit of a headache because things come out and then you think why are things not working anymore and it can just be that your wires have come unplugged so what i've got uh, myself i'll come back to this diagram in a second so what i've got over here is I've, i'm using the uh, raspberry pi starter kit breadboard which has got the raspberry pi pico there and it has a whole bunch of uh, jumper wires that wire directly into the servos themselves um, and then a, a bunch of them go from the screen into the raspberry pi as well now, one of the things that uh, one of the challenges I came up against was actually powering this. You're not really supposed to power servos through um, the Raspberry Pi Pico's 5 volt because you'll just pull too much power through it uh, and blow the thing up. So I thought, well, I'll just plug in a 9 volt battery and power it that way. Don't plug 9 volt batteries into MG90 servos. You get the magic smoke. I got that coming out of some of these and it smelled for horribly for a while. Uh, and, and these are not cheap. Um, I mean, they're, they're cheap for a servo. They're cheap. The blue ones, the SG90s are cheap. These ones are a bit more expensive. So I was a bit annoyed that I'd wasted any money at all on that. So so you can see there we have a bunch of wires. So the SPI device has quite a few. It's got ground and voltage, just needs five volts from the five volt supply. Uh, it has a uh, chip select or cable select um, pin there. It has a reset, you can just reset the screen. Uh, it has an A0, not sure that stands for if I'm really honest. It's got the uh, data and the clock, and it also has an SD, uh, sorry, it has an LED, which 
is just the, the screen power. Now you can just connect that directly to the five volt, or if you connect it to another pin, um, you can adjust the amount of brightness by just adjusting the amount of uh, current that goes to that. So if you drop it right down, just use like pulse width modulation, just like it's a regular LED, and it will adjust the screen brightness. But I've just got that hardwired in, so it's full on full brightness. I mean, it's, it's, it's good enough. So um, that's all it is for the screen. And then the servos simply just take the signal pin from each of them. And I've got it on pin zero, pin one and pin two. So really nice and simple there. Uh, and yeah, and ideally you're supposed to pull the power from a third party power supply, but I'm actually cheating and pulling all three servos through the Raspberry Pi Pico, which is not really recommended, but um, it's a shortcut, it works. I had some really weird behavior with my bench power supply and I've seen this before with the um, servos. If I plug that in, um, I don't know if I can get a shot of this. Uh, let me see if I can get, can I go over to that camera there? There you go. So I've got this bench power supply just here. Um, it's not an expensive one. It can do um, between um, five and 30 volts and up to five amps, um, which is great. However, whenever I plug the, the servos in, they start jittering like mad. So there's something weird going on about that. And the way that you set the ampage on this is you actually short the pins out and then turn the dial and then let go. So I wonder if there's some kind of current protection that's kicking in there and is interfering with the pulse width. But um, I can't get that to work properly with any of the Raspberry Pi Picos and servos. So that's why I avoided doing that. Okay, so let's uh, have a look. Once we've got the thing wired up, what do we do next? So placing the pen rather than moving the servo. So this is all about inverse kinematics. Uh, I did watch a really great video by um, James Bruton about how to do inverse kinematics and he was showing it on um, OpenDog. I think all versions of OpenDog use inverse kinematics. And it's just a matter of solving, you know, usually two or three triangles uh, to give you the angles of the servos that you need to turn them to to get the position of whatever it is you're trying to position, whether it's a foot or, in our case, the pen on the canvas to be where we want it to be. So inverse kinematics means that we can focus on where we want the pen to be rather than focusing on the servos and what they're going to be originally. Uh, we just use a function to work out what the servo position should be and achieve that. Uh, and then it's simple trigonometry. It is quite simple trigonometry, but it's one of those things, if you weren't paying attention in high school on that day, you might think this is really confusing. So um, let's have a, a bit more of a look at what this means then. So from a maths point of view, there's really just two or three triangles that we need to solve here. So the physics of this thing, if I just, here's one I prepared earlier. Um, so we've got two servos that are essentially just going to change their angle. And depending on what they are collectively, it'll move this point around here. Now, what we do know is that this is a fixed length and this is a fixed length. And then if I look, turn this round, the actual piece that the pen connects to uh, is also fixed as well. So that L2 there, uh, that is the fixed piece because you think, why is it not going around? It's going direct to the end point. And that's because um, just because it's shaped like this V shape uh, doesn't mean to say that the triangle isn't actually a direct line to that point there. So. So we've got a number of um, fixed points that we, fixed lengths that we can put into our calculation. So L1 and L2 give us two parts of the triangle. Um, that can actually be a different angle, which is, if I just move the cursor there, that can be a different angle there. This can be a different length, um, but the position of this angle can actually be derived because of the position that this angle is in. So we, we've got down here a number of different angles that we need to solve and we just put them into this um, formula and sort of say where do we need where you know what we want as a result is what the two positions should be of the serve the left server and the, the right servo uh, other couple of things that we need to feed into the algorithm is the position of um, the x and y zero so on our canvas this is our starting point so the servos are actually sort of a negative value and they're a positive value in the x direction so there's one point there which is that zero one x and zero one y and then zero two x and zero two y is the second servo so they're offset from that x point there that we need to record and um, the the length of that little piece there as well is also known that l3 L4 is the piece there, if it didn't have that little connector on, so that's just um, this piece here, which is just a simple piece all on its own. And um, what else is, and, and then C is always going to be the same, well, sorry, 
C is calculated, it's not always going to be the same. C is going to be calculated for each of those two pieces. Uh, so what we want to feed in is, we want to feed in the TX and the TY, that's our target. Um, this HX and HY is where the, the pivot, oops, sorry, the pivot point is on the, the two pieces. Um, and then we want to calculate what return, what the, the two values is for the servos as a as an angle and then we have to convert the angle into a pulse width to set the servos so there's quite a lot going on there um, when i took this code over i had no idea how this worked i just got the arduino code translated this into micropython and then and then something didn't work so i had to start unpicking and understanding how this is actually working and it's not 100 percent there yet as you'll see in a minute there's some kind of scaling factor that's not quite right um, we're going to have a look at that and we're going to see what we can do about that so as it says there on the slide, we need to calculate the angles for each of the servos. We do this by solving the triangles. We know the length of the arms, the position of the XY origin, and the different positions of the servos. And once we have those angles, we can then set the servos to the, uh, to the position, and the pen will then be in the correct position that we want it to be in. So quite a lot going on there. And the reason it's called inverse kinematics is if we want to move the servos and we set the, the angles directly, that's called... Um, just kinematics so inverse is when we want to set this point and, and define where that is uh, on, on the 3d space the 2d space in this case um, then it's inverse because it will give us the angle um, if we work backwards from there just by solving those different triangles so translating the arduino code into micropython not as hard as you would think um, there were some gotchas in there for sure one of the, the reasons i couldn't get the code working was i was using um, which is in the Arduino code, a function called floor, where it's a bit like if you have a ceiling or a floor, you can say don't go lower than a particular value so that you don't get negative values or values below zero, for example. So you can use this floor function to make sure that doesn't happen. And I hadn't included some brackets around some of the code. So that meant that it just wasn't working properly and it was just skewing all the results. Um, some things are really straightforward to do. So if you can see on the screen there, um, we have... Um, the TFT underscore ST7735 library. I found a library on the internet which works perfectly for MicroPython um, and it has all the exact same functions as the Adafruit one. So whoever wrote this, thank you very much for doing that because that made this translation a, a blast, just very easy to do. So anytime there was a function in the Arduino library, um, it was the exact same command, maybe just slightly formatted differently because of MicroPython uh, and it meant that it was kind of one for one. Um, other things like setting the variables is pretty simple, the constant, so draw human move. So in this game of uh, tic-tac-toe, either you can draw the um, the circles yourself. If you're on um, noughts, then uh, you can draw that yourself. Or if you want the robot to draw that for you, you can just sort of say human move um, true. So I've actually set that to true on here because it's just more fun to see it draw it out, I think. Um, the... The Arduino version had a serial monitor, so you can use the serial monitor to to send commands or to read the status of what's going on. Um, I've left that in here, even though pretty much this version of the code runs directly from the REPL, from the read, evaluate, print, loop command console from uh, MicroPython, whether you're using Thony or whether you're using something like Visual Studio Code to do that. So I've left that in, and in... In the fullness of time, I'll make this so it's a lot more interactive. So it'd be really cool if you had a camera that could detect what has been played rather than you having to sort of type in a number or something like that. So I'll show you how that works in a demo uh, in a moment or two. But yeah, this took me roughly, I would say, a few evenings just to type out all the code and then debug the issues. And it's the debugging of the issues when you don't understand the maths behind the inverse kinematics that can make things really, really interesting because... Either it just doesn't work at all or your servos are sort of going all over the place. So um, I will share the code with you. Um, the code is actually in a link to the video on YouTube. I'm not sure it's on the Facebook video. Uh, but if you look on the YouTube video for this, there is actually a link. Uh, but I'll share that with you. Uh, if you just go to github.com slash Kevin McAleer slash Tico, sorry, Pico dash Tico, then you'll find the code that I've uh, created there. Um, and I'll also give you the link as well to the original one to Tico as well. That's on there too if you just want to go with the original Arduino version. Why not? Okay, so some facts about tic-tac-toe. <laughs> that would give you some interesting facts about this. Because you learn things when you're building these robots. You, you, things that you wouldn't think you would know about. Tic-tac-toe, there is a lot of possible games. I didn't think there was as many as that. Um, 
if you if there's different ways you can win on it you can actually win in five moves so there's 1440 possible moves where you can win in five moves you can win in six you can win in seven eight or nine and draw you can draw in many different ways as well almost half as many as uh, as the winning moves um and overall yes there's 2000 sorry 255,168 possible games that you can play now i was looking at that number and i was thinking does that include all the mirror images and rotational games because you could actually make that number smaller if you think about this you know i'm going to say more cleverly but that's not a very good use of english if i get my little uh, my little board here <laughs> which i had to buy just to get this pen so i could create this robot um, if I just do this for a second, I can show you on here. Let's go full screen so I can show you this. I've also just realised, I think I put that on there with a permanent marker. So I'm going to have to take a, some alcohol wipes to that. So if we've got a game of tic-tac-toe like this, and we, oops, that's a, yeah, this, this, I left the lid off on this and it ran out. So thank goodness I went to the shops today and bought some other pens, which are much better. Right, so if I'm going to play that move there, that's actually rotatable, isn't it? So you could, that is the exact same move as if that was down there. It's just been rotated sort of around that way. And similar, if we rotated that again, that way, it's there. And if we rotated it there once more. So there's quite a few different orientations to a lot of the games. Uh, and I think if we removed all the different versions of games that could be rotated, and similar, if you mirror it, so there's two lots of symmetry there, we can, we can mirror things that way down so that that is the mirror opposite of that game, or if that was on that side there, the mirror opposite is over there. So it's not the same as rotating it, depending on what other play, what other piece have been played on the board at the time, but that would reduce the number down of possible games, I suspect. Not sure if that was included on there. Anyway, then I also found a printable um, map, a complete optical map, um, optimal map, in fact, of all the different tic-tac-toe moves. So every time somebody plays one, you would just basically just zoom in on that particular area of this uh, printable thing, and it will give you all the, the either winning moves or the moves that will uh, ensure a draw. So with tic-tac-toe, if you know the rules and you know how to play, you'll never lose. You'll either win or you'll draw, but you should never lose a game, even if you're the second player to start. But whoever starts first has a really big um, advantage. Um, whoever plays second is at a disadvantage. There's not as many moves uh, with being the second player. Uh, and you can see that. Um, so if you, if you start with... Um, it says that map for X, map for zero, depending if the person who starts is the zero and then map for X, or if you have the X uh, and they're playing zero, you can see there's a lot more uh, variations there as well. So a lot of, <laughs> a lot of interesting facts. So if you want a copy of that, go to that uh, xkcd.com slash 832 and you'll get a copy of that as well. So if you like these videos, please give me a like. Please drop a comment um, in the video, whether you're watching on Facebook or whether you're watching on YouTube. And of course, you have to subscribe because why would you want to miss out on any of this really great robot stuff? And it's just getting better all the time. So um, if you like what I do, there's more and more of this coming every week. And um, I drop a video every single Sunday. So I do try and get a video midweek. I couldn't actually get this one out this week because um, I, I was struggling with getting the, the, the physical part of the robot built, printed, assembled, debugged, translated from Arduino to MicroPython, and then debugged to actually work properly. And I couldn't actually get that done in the, in the sort of evenings that I had available. So um, I'll try and get one out next week, um, which will be a mini version of this video today, but focusing more on the... Um, the robotics and some fun stuff i want it to actually write out stuff on the screen as well as just drawing pictures so um yes yeah, so there's always a video every sunday seven o'clock ish greenwich mean time i think we're on gmt plus one at the moment and um there is a midweek video which is pre-recorded which will just get released maybe around five o'clock on a wednesday thursday or friday depending on what's going on there okay so tico and plot clock so this robot has a bit of heritage. So you can see there on the left hand, that is the robot that I saw uh, on, I think it was Facebook, Instagram, and possibly on Reddit. I think he'd marketed this out um, just as he created it. He'd only created it back in August, so it's not actually been going that long. Um, and it's very, very similar to the Plot Clock, which is what it was based on. Plot Clock will write out what the time is, and then it will erase it, and then it will write out what the time is, and then it will erase it, and it will keep doing that forever. Uh, and it's really fun. And you can see there it's got the exact same um, setup of the two servos, 
the sort of joining together, holding the pen, the little eraser thing that um, sits on 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 the screen. Oh, let me show you that on the board. Um, that's the little eraser thing there. So the pen just basically goes into that and then slides out, and it can erase it. And then it can slide it back, jump out, and then it leaves it behind. It's really clever, really um, innovative is the word I was looking for there. And um, yeah, on the video, and we'll have a look at that in a second, Alex plays a game with the robot, um, and I'll give you a bit of a narrative of what's going on there. But if you want to get a copy of that, you want to get either the STL files or you want to see the, the really detailed instructions that Alex has put together on how to build this, then head over to playrobotics.com, and then he's got their slash blog slash tico dash tic tac toe dash arduino dash robot dash documentation. Bit of a mouthful, but that's where all the documentation lists for that. If you want to get the plot clock, uh, and I can't even murder that name. Um, I think it's a Norwegian name. So is it... Uh, and I don't know if you pronounce the K and the J or whether it's just like Jettel or if it's Kjettel. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for butchering your name. But yeah, he's he's got two places where you can get these. You can go to um, instructables.com slash plot dash clock dash four dash dummies. Or you can go to Thingiverse and it's Thing 248009. Uh, and you can grab that there. So that's what Alex did. He he took Plot Clock. He loved what had been created there. And he thought, what can I do with that? I can make the exact, I can use the exact same hardware and I can create a robot that plays tic-tac-toe. I think later versions of Plot Clock, did they have this screen? I know that might, have, that might have been created by Alex as well, actually. So the SPI screen that's on there, it's really fun what he's done. It's got like two eyes and then the eyes change color depending on whose turn it is. And there's a little bit of text underneath as well. So I had some fun putting um, some graphics together. I'll, I will demo that in a second. And um, one of the challenges I came up against is you can't put text on anything other than a black background. The way that it's, um, it must be a really simple library. So instead of just taking whatever background color it is and just like XOR in the text over the top, it just blasts black over the, the screen. So if you try and have a nice graphical display and then you put text on it, it looks really ugly. So I might have to improve that code and make it so that you can actually, I believe it a bit slower perhaps because it has to do a bit more, but we can do that. That's not a problem. So let's have a look at this thing in action, shall we? So we sped it up there a little bit. It draws out the board. And then it draws the X, because it's going first. And it says there, your move. And he's drawing on there. And what he's doing off camera, he has a little remote control like this one uh, with an infrared. And he presses one of the numbers, one to nine. And that will tell the computer which, which game he's playing. And then if it gets to, is he going to let it win? Or is he going to let it, he's going to let it win. So he's going to do that. It can draw an X in the bottom corner. And then it'll know that it's won, and therefore it'll draw a line through the game. How awesome is that? Tico wins. <laughs> so it's got a buzzer on board as well on that version, um, which means um, it can just do that little beep as well. So yes, um, I was just showing you there, um, it has a little infrared remote. Um, I've actually got the exact same kit for this. It comes with the infrared remote and a little LED um, and infrared receiver. I think LED is like um, like the one that's in here. It can just flash out infrared, and then there's like an infrared receiver that can just receive that. But you have to code up all the, uh, you know, if, if somebody presses a button on there, it's going to send a, a sequence of, of um, ons and offs, and you have to capture that and, and interpret that as a, a particular number. But it doesn't mean you can you can program any remote control. So yes, the original version Tico is based on an Arduino Nano. Uh, uses infrared to send the square that's been played to the robot. Uh, it also has a buzzer on board as well, so it can do that little beep. And um, he's recently created a Facebook group. So if you want to join that, you can see there's a whole load of numbers there. I think he needs to just give it um, the, the friendly name so it's easier to find. And yeah, check out Play Robotics on playrobotics.com as well. Um, Alex has been really generous in open sourcing this and sharing the STLs and writing some really great uh, instructions and sharing the code. So um, it's only fair to give him a really good shout out for that, I think. Okay, so the software is four parts to the software. So there's some display graphics. There's some stuff where you just do like TFT dot and then you just give it like a rectangle or text or whatever you want to do. 
there is all the code around moving the servos and the inverse kinematics and that's what i've got on the right hand side of the screen there it's called set xy it takes an x position and a an y position of where you want the pen to be and then what it will return well what it will actually do it doesn't return the value it just makes the, the servos move um, it moves into the position where that pen will be in the correct place then there's some code for playing the game and keeping score and remembering what who's played what in what position uh, and it's kind of a three state thing so we go back to our little board there and I just uh, erase that for a second I can quickly show you what I mean by that so when when we first start the game and we just draw out the board so each of the, the cells these nine cells are all empty so in the background we've got a little array that just stores minus one for each of them meaning that they're empty then a player will typically play a position so that will be like maybe maybe the fourth position i think they actually go one two three four five six seven eight nine it's a weird orientation whatever um so that'll be stored in the array uh, and that might be because it's the first player that might be a value of zero and then when somebody plays another which is the noughts then that'll be a value of one so it can either be one of three states minus one zero or one so we can store that in three bits three bits Three bits we can still it in three bits okay let's get back over to keynote there um so that's the playing of the game keeping the score so there's just an array of that and the number of um there's an array that has the number of positions left available um as just a shrinking uh, array so it's very easy to find a, an available slot if you're just picking a random number and then we've got the pen drawing routine so things that um when we say move this um to a particular position we want it to do more than that we want it to draw out the board so it needs to know how to move the pen to the top to draw to the bottom go to the top again offset a bit draw to the bottom draw the horizontal lines how to draw a circle how to draw an x and how to draw a circle and x in each of the nine positions and then how to do the diagonals the cross and the each of the rows and the columns for a winner as well so there's quite a few different drawing commands that we need to, to store in there as well so that's the four sections of the code we'll have a look at that as well um, i think we've got a bit of time to do that um, but it is quite dry some of the code i think the most interesting bit is this set xy function here so you can see there there's a whole bunch of um, different variables it's going to set in there so the first couple the x the dx and the dy they're going to store what the target position is going to be minus the offset of the the origin point of the canvas then you're going to work out what the polar length of c is if you remember c is that that um c is the angle if we have these here which is between that point and that point there so it's kind of like a diagonal line just down there so c is going to be worked out by figuring out the square root between the dx and the yx sorry the, the dx yes the dx and the yx and then adding those together then we work out what the angles a1 and a2 are and they're the two angles between there's like that imaginary triangle down there uh, and they use you know use the arctan2 function so you just take the dy and dx it's always that way around which confuses you if you've not used that before then there's another function which is a bit more complex that's called return angle so it takes the length of I think let me just get this right that is l1 that is l2 that's l3 no that little one is l3 and that's l4 so it will take those values and it will send them with the value of c which is the length of that and what it will get back is the angle that that servo for a1 needs to be or a2 uh, then we can just work out what the pulse needs to be for that and flow just means don't go any lower than uh, than zero i guess because we don't want it to move negative values i think and then we just add together the angle a2 plus a2 minus pi we multiply that by a servo factor and i think this servo factor is the thing that's currently messing my code up i'm going to show you in a minute what's going on it's not quite right and then it adds the servo left null position so the servo left null position is where we want the where the servos are uh, when they're when they're in their sort of default position if i can explain that and then we set the left servo using the duty underscore under and that's an unsigned 16-bit number so um, two bytes and uh, we send the pulse to the servo using that command and then we do the same again with the second servo so that's a bunch of code down there and then the third one is to do with the um 
what is the third? No, that's that's. There's only two pieces there. There's just a left and a right. The third servo is the lift function, and you can make it lift up. And there's there's about three different positions you want the pen to be in. You either want it to be touching the canvas, you want it to be completely lifted up, or you want it to be kind of in a half position. And the half position is when we want it to grab hold of the um, eraser and wipe the board with it. We want to, we don't want it to sort of pile drive down and burn the servo. They get quite hot the servos if you put put them under too much stress. So that's the, the software as a kind of overview. So some of the things I've learned with this and what you can avoid doing if you're going to build this yourself. So translating the code is trivial in parts and a bit annoying in other parts when stuff doesn't quite work and you've got to then think through, okay, I can just blindly translate the code, but what's going on here? So you have to understand the code if you're going to write this. And also if you're writing, some, if you're translating somebody else's code, they might not have written that optimally, or they might have written that really optimally, which makes it confusing to, to code. This was actually quite well written, so it wasn't too difficult to do. Um, I didn't use any nylock nuts, so the little nuts that you get with the nylon thing inside, and when you screw on, it kind of grabs a hold of it. I didn't use them, so every five minutes I'm having to sort of get my screwdriver out on my, my pliers and sort of just adjust um, the screws to make them tight again. That's really annoying. And that can also make you get confused if you're trying to debug something that's going on. It could just be a loose nut that's making it throw off a bit. The third point there is my math is a little bit rusty. Is it math or maths? Or does that depend where you are in the world? I always say math. Uh, so my math is a bit rusty. I had to trust the calculations just worked rather than, you know, falling back on my understanding of the fundamentals. Now, I do want to understand how this works. So I'm going to slow time, read up how this works and figure this out myself. I usually get Excel open, write the formulas in like kind of longhand just to uh, understand it rather than just hacking the code together. Because uh, you can kind of change it in real time in Excel rather than having to sort of run the code again. So the libraries work quite easy to find. So finding equivalent MicroPython libraries wasn't as hard as you might think. Um, some people have purposely made these, you know, like for like the, Ad the Adafruit libraries. Um, so actually converting them, converting the library calls very straightforward. So Richard says, uh, maths is UK, math is US generally. I'm not clearly um, an, um, an America file. I don't know you call that. <laughs> I clearly prefer their way of uh, speaking. Uh, so yes, I did blow up three of my um, MG90 servos that I bought specifically for this project. I got the actual magic smoke coming out of these. I was like going at the, I was like, why is this not turning? This should be turning now. And I just turned up the voltage and then all the smoke came out the top. And I thought, I'm sure these can be like 12 volts. No, no. Six volts maximum. Don't do that. <laughs> And then finding a whiteboard pen that fits into the particular model was a bit of a challenge. So this is the, the first version that I had. Um, and what I was going to do is just get like a, a Sharpie and then just stick that in there. And they kind of do stick in just about, which is good. But Sharpies are not dry wipe um, pens, they're permanent markers. So I had to find some dry wipe pens. I mean, these look very much like a Sharpie and they work just as well. And what I found is if I have a bit of an engineer's friend, if I get a bit of blue tack, uh, I can put a little bit in there if it's not quite a snug enough fit. Uh, but I did manage to find this in um, in the supermarket, which is, just grab that off there. A little dry white board. I think this was about two, two or three pounds, so not very expensive at all. Um, and it came with the, some magnetic stuff as well as well as the little pen. So where's my little pen gone? I think I might have dropped that on the floor. So that came with this little pen and this is the exact right size for um, for this to plug into. So put that in there with a bit of blue tack and then that's a really good fit and that works just right. Now, unfortunately, I just came to this uh, today to do a quick test before the show and the pen has actually run out or it's dried up because I've left the lid off all night so yeah there's a little tip don't do that and then the last thing that I found which was really useful was on this very same dry white marker that I've got here uh, it has a little eraser on the the top there so you can sort of erase and that's exactly the right size for the puck that you need for it to uh, fit into so the idea here is that um, the marker pen can go along sort of sit inside here and show you that and then it can sort of wipe the board and then it can sort of come out and just leave that in its little um, 
a little gripper that's at the side there. So if I go to the overhead, there's like a little gripper that just sits off the side there and it just slides in. Very simple to slide in. Cool. So I'm going to show you in a minute. Don't worry. It's really cool. It's worth waiting for. Um, so what else is there? Yeah, finding the pen that would fit um, wasn't the easiest. So um, the one that was suggested in the instructions wasn't available anymore on Amazon. It was like out of stock, no longer stocking that. So it's a reasonably enough size. It works fine with Sharpies. So if you find some Sharpie dry wipes, um, then they will work perfectly. Okay, what else? Next steps. So this robot has loads of potential. Um, I was looking into tic-tac-toe things as you do, doing a bit of research, and I found this thing that's called a min-max algorithm. And min-max um, are used in game theory. So is it um, von Neumann, who was um, one of the sort of pioneers in, in maths and computer science in the early days? Um, I think he worked, or he was a peer of um, Alan Turing as well. So they worked on things called min-max algorithms, and it's like, how do you win a particular game? What's the minimum and maximum? So how do you minimise your damages and maximise your wins? And min-max algorithms do exactly that. And there is one for tic-tac-toe, and it's about four or five lines long. It's really, really simple to do. So we can make the game... It would be really boring because we can make the game always be won or drawn by the robot and we could never win so that's not really fun it's much more fun if it's random because you've at least a chance of winning there um, we, we can certainly add more drawing capabilities to this so I'm going to go for a larger version like I said on my um, my board over here I want to have like uh, the very top there have um, the arms sort of come down and it can draw out my calendar every day or every month or every week or however often I want and maybe circle various different dates and stuff like that and maybe able to pick different pens as well that'd be really cool so loads of different things we can do that but also with this little robot we can make it draw out post-it notes as well because this is about the same size as a post-it note so we could use a very similar robot if this doesn't exist I will create this um, that can draw out a post-it note that'd be so cool um, what else yes and I was thinking about <laughs> Bob Ross, but a robot up with an erasable canvas. It doesn't have to be erasable, it could be post-it notes. He could draw a post-it note out, little trees and uh, little clouds and happy accidents and all that good stuff, but as a robot with a big afro. So that's gonna happen, that will happen. <laughs> what else is there? So the min-max algorithm, um, to make it win or draw every game, it tries to, it looks at all the different possible games that can be played given the current um, position on the board. And then it will give each of those a score, whether it's a losing, a draw or a winning um, position. And it will then bubble to the top all the winning moves. Um, and whichever's got the high score, that's what it picks. So if, if they've all got the same score, it just picks the first one because it doesn't matter. Uh, but if one's got a much higher score because it's much more likelihood that you'll win with that, that's what it will pick. So there's only about three different layers that it needs to get to and it will win. So... That's a very brief introduction, the briefest of introductions to MinMax. It's worth checking out if you've not done that before, but that's something I'll put in there as an option. I was thinking on the menu, we could have an option where you um, you you can play randomly or you can play with the, min, you know, the, uh, the MinMax algorithm and never win. <laughs> Why not? So, demo time. Let's have a look at this thing in action, shall we? Right, let me go over to my overhead for a second. So at the moment, it's um, it's powered on. It's got the screen lit up, the pen's there. This is looking a bit dirty because it's been used a lot. And what this actually is, if I just pull this off for a second, this, it's like a, a purpose-made little card, uh, 3D printed with packing tape over the top. So it's got like this um, uh, packing tape. You can just see that it's a bit shiny. And that means that we can we can use it as like a dry wipe thing. So I bought an entire roll of packing tape just for this very purpose. So if I just slide that back over there, pull a little eraser thing back in place, then we're ready to go. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to load up uh, Visual Studio on my computer there. Uh, I'm going to get that so we can actually see what's going on on the screen as well. So if I go over to, to here, and let's just move out of the way that for a second. Shall we just zoom in on the screen a little bit so that we can see the code? Okay. I'll go through the code. I'll give you a demo first so you can see what's going on. So I'm just going to go into the combination mode. There we go. And I'm just going to hit the run button to run the code. Right. So let's just line that up. Okay. So the first thing it's going to do is it's going to draw out the uh, the game board just to show you that it's, it's working and uh, the display is functioning and so on. Let's just try and move that down a little bit. 
you can see its little face there. So it looks a bit funky at the moment. Something's not quite right with the code. It seems to be all squished and the arcing a little bit. I think it's also a bit too fast, which isn't helping. And I think yeah, all the, uh, the nuts are tight and everything. And if you can see on the screen there as well, it says, I'm Tico, so I'm Pico Tico, press S to start. So if I press S to start, it's gonna draw out that board again. And he draws it the exact same place, so we know that the code's working, and then he'll position his thing. He's drawn an X there. I think he drew it that fast that it's a bit of a, a bit of a squish. But uh, you can see on the screen though, it says current game board, it's got the X in the middle, and then it's got the numbers that you can play. So rather than using the infrared thing, I've just gone for just press a number in the read evaluate print loop console. So human, enter your move. So I'm gonna enter number nine, which is the the sort of top left. So he's gonna draw that in for me. He's drawn a circle there. He's then drawn his little X, which looks terrible. <laughs> that is an X, I'll tr trust me. He's drawn an X at the top there, at the bottom, sorry. Yes, we are looking at that the correct way around. So that's the same as what's on the screen there. So I'm gonna do number eight, which should give me that position there. So I think this will be a better circle. It looks more legible as a circle. He's drawing his X at the top there. And then let's go for number seven. Now this should win, but I think my code's broken because it doesn't detect that that's a win. <laughs> He's just carrying on as if I've not won at all. So I'm gonna go for six and let him win on that bottom column there. So if he does that, he's then gonna draw that line to say that he's won. So something's not quite right with the scaling there. It seems to be all squished up and some of the lines are not straight, they're kind of arcing. So that tells me that something's not quite right in the code. And in the code, which we can have a look at in a second, there is this scaling factor. And I think it's to do with that. There's, there's two lots of scaling factors. There's one for each of the servos. And then there's another one on top of that as well, um, which I, I don't understand why they're there or or how much to scale them and I've I must have spent about four or five hours yesterday tweaking each one a little bit and not very much and the thing was over here and it was printing it very large or too small um, and this was about as good as I could get it by just messing about by trial and error but what I want to do instead is go back to the basics understand how it's solving these triangles so that it positions it 100% and at the moment I can't get it to do the arrays function because it can't position itself to the arrays um, the little puck that uh, erases it because it's not working properly. So sorry about that. That's that's where we're at. But let's have another game of this. What I'm going to do, I'm going to take out the little board because he can't erase it himself. I'm just going to do it manually. So I'm just going to get that and I'm just going to erase it. But you can see, look how nicely it erases just using that little little puck thing. So that will work fine. The lifting up works fine. There's no problems lifting up place that lifting the pen up and down I've got that to be just right that was easy enough to tweak if I just move that down there and then the other thing um, that I've really had fun doing was the the graphics on the screen there so what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this down here and I'm going to zoom in a bit more if I can on the actual display so the colors not coming quite through very well here but let's go let's play it again so I'm just going to get it to do um, start another game uh, let's see if I can get that zoomed in a bit better so that you can actually see what it says. So it says game is on and it's got um, the left, the right eye showing at the moment, the left eye and then it says your move. So I'm going to just do uh, another move there and it says Pico, Tico time and then your move again. So let's just do another one that's already taken. So let's try number three um, and then let's try number eight. I just want to win. Uh, sorry, I just want it to lose so that it can win. And then let's go for number seven. So that'll force the win. So there we go. And then it says Pico Tico wins. And then it goes back to the menu as well. So there's a bit of code that's just showing you the menu. And you can start the game. You can erase the board. You can draw the frame, which just draws out the, uh, the game board. Or you can go to the home position, which is where the eraser is. So if I go home, it doesn't actually go home properly. So if I just move that back there. And I go to... Press the H button for home. It's just drawing up the the, uh, <laughs> the board again. I need to check the code there. It just started playing the game then when I pressed the home, which is weird. So I need to check the, the loop there. So yeah, it's looking very squished up um, and 
at a bit of an angle as well. So this is sort of an arc. And again, that tells me that something's not quite out. It needs to be in the center. When you look at Alex's board, his was pretty, pretty square on. There was little ticks on the, when it drew stuff, but that's just how it draws on the board. So quite a few um, little improvements we need to make there. So let's now have a look at the code itself. So let me just um, quit the game there. And let's just scroll down a little bit. We'll not look at all the code. We'll, I'll just give you kind of a flavor of what's going on. So we've got a whole bunch at the top here of things that we're importing. So we're importing the uh, constant from MicroPython. We're importing the TFT screen from the TFT library. We're importing sleep. We're importing a bunch of maths functions. So we've got the um, arc, um, arc cosine function, we've got the cosine, the sine function, the arc tan2 function, we have, which is arc tangent, we have the floor, which um, returns the x of an integral, and uh, we've got the square root, and we have pi function as well. Uh, we then have a, f a servo library, and I'm bringing in from that the maximum pulse width and the servo, and it looks like I'm not actually using them, but I am actually using the map value, so I'm not using any of the servo functions at all. I'm simply using this map value. I'm sure I actually brought that in as a, as a function. I could probably comment out and the code would still work. So the map value we've looked at before, and that's where it will, um, given any value and a minimum and maximum of whatever that value is from. So say it's a percentage and we give it 5%. We say it's from between zero and 100%. And then it will when we're then giving an out factor. So say we wanted um, the percentage to be scaled um, between, I don't know, three and four million, for example, it will then return the, what the value of 5% would be, but between three and a million, whatever I've just said. So that's what the map function does. It's really useful, returns a new mapped value in the desired range. So I use this all the time for, for doing different scaling of things. It's a really useful function. We then bring in random because random helps us do random numbers so we can just randomly play the game without any kind of strategy. We bring in the SPI interface, the pin and the pulse width modulation. So that's for the screen and for the servos. And then the screen, this uh, TFT uh, ST7735, it needs a font to be able to draw stuff to the screen. So the library doesn't come with any fonts. <clears throat> but luckily the people who had written the library also provided uh, about two or three different fonts. So I'm using the system font and it comes in different sizes. There's about, I think about three different sizes that can be displayed on the screen from sort of small, medium, large and lots of different colors as well. So um, that's really useful to, to bring in. And then there's a whole bunch of variables. In fact, the next couple of lines are all variables that are just set so you can configure how you want to play the game. So I've got this set currently so that it draws my knots and it draws the, the crosses as well. The serial mode means that we're actually using the console down here to drive it. In future versions, we could perhaps turn that off and have it a bit more intelligently done. And I've also got this calibrate function. So if calibrate is enabled, there's another block of code further down uh, that runs before the main program does just to draw the stuff out. So I've got it to draw like a square. Uh, and if the square works, if the square looks square, then you know you've got um, everything worked out properly. Then we've got the servo pin, so two, one, and zero. So the left servo is on pin GPIO zero, GPIO one, and then GPI two. Then we have a maximum and minimum duty cycle. So this was one of the values I had to play around with to try and get this right. So SG90s and MG90s. So the SG is just the plastic version, the MG is the, the sort of metal version on the, the top. I don't know if I've got one of the other versions to sort of show you to hand. Um, they take a pulse width and it's between a range of values. Now on the Arduino code, it was between 550 and 2500 as the range of, of pulse width you needed to provide. On MicroPython, for some reason, they've gone with a whole 16 bit number. So it's between 1200 and 8620. So whatever reason that is, we can use that map function to scale stuff. Now, again, that might be one of the things that's skewing this. Um, what I need to do is not use these absolute values, but just pass it in an angle and have it calculate that for me. So I am kind of using Alex's code and he might have been using the code that came from Plot Clock originally. 
there's a, probably a whole bunch of commented out stuff there. This is how it was originally set up and I've just changed stuff. So originally there was lift zero, lift one and lift two. And I thought they were really bad variable names. So I've changed it to pen up, pen down and I've left lift one there. I don't actually think that's used anywhere in the code. So we could probably comment that out. There's a Z offset, which is for when you're trying to put the pen onto the surface, you can offset it by a little value. So they've added this sort of fudge factor there. Um, but you can just change the pen value anyway, so that's not a problem. And originally they had these as um, pulse width values, I think. Although that wouldn't really make sense if it's 6,000. They had a value that wasn't an angle, and I thought it makes more sense to define what the angle is rather than uh, put in a pulse width. Um, then there's a speed, so how quickly do you want it to sort of move around? So this lift speed is just um, what is it, a hundredth of a second currently. Is that hundred tenth, hundred, maybe a thousandth of a second? Um, so it's pretty quick, pretty instantaneous. Then we set up the servos themselves. We go through, we set the pulse width for each of those servo pins that we defined. Uh, we set the frequency to 50. I think they actually default to 50, so that's not a problem, but I was just making sure. Uh, and then we set up what the L LCD um, pins are. So this requires a whole bunch of them. So we need the, uh, the cable select or chip select, the reset, the um, DC pin. I'm not sure what that one is. Don't think that's actually used actually. And then we pass in the SPI 16, 17 and 18 pins. And that's I think what I've got wired up as per the diagram I showed you earlier. Um, then we do this servo left factor. So originally they set this to 690. I have no idea what 690 means as a value. So is that a pulse width? Is it some other value? I don't know. So what I've done is I've said whatever it is, map in the value between, so if it's 80, if we take uh, 690 and we figure out what that is as an angle, uh, and I think the way that I did this, let me see if I can share my screen properly so you can see this. I've got it on current application at the moment. So if I go for secondary display, no, I want primary display. Uh, if I do, there we go. If I do, um, 1950 divided by and then 2500 which is the maximum pulse width you could have on the Arduino and then times that by 180 for the degrees we get what the actual angle was for that and it was originally 140.4 and similarly for that 815 that would be 58 so that's where those values come from Let's just change that back to current application. There we go. So that's what they originally were. And then I've tweaked them. So 155 and 70 is now the angle. And then from that, it just returns what the pulse width is. Uh, and then, sorry, we're on the wrong screen there. And then there's a whole bunch of other ones. We define what the length of all those different arms are. So that's these, these positions here. So what's the length of that? What's the length of that? And so on. So there's just four of them. We then define what the origin points are. So the origin point is, as per that diagram before, if I just jump to the overhead, that corner just there is zero, zero. So everything else is in relation to that point there. It looks really bad there, doesn't it? Uh, let's go back to the screen there. Um, the eraser is the eraser, as you'd expect. That's where that lives. And then the last X and last Y position are just helps when you're drawing a line, like a vector, you just want to know what the last position of that was. And then we have this board values. This is where it stores all the different values. Remember I said it's minus, it's minus one for it's an empty cell, zero for player one and one for player two. Uh, and then what are the current number of empty spaces that are available? So there's currently nine, we've just got a thing for that. And then winner is set to minus one if nobody's won and one if somebody's won. And then I've created um, a couple of one values here for the window position. So these are for the coordinates on the screen. So it draws like, it's a bit like a Macintosh type screen. It has um, a, a white background with a little header and it has a little block that's colored in purple and some lines. So it looks like uh, the old System 7 Mac software. <laughs> so that's what that does. And then there's a whole bunch of different functions. So setup just runs once and just sets up everything. So this is really just drawing out the screen and just waiting. So um, it draws, when the, when the robot comes on, it kind of flashes its eyes like that, blinks, and then just says, welcome to, uh, I'm Pico Tico. So that's what it does. So that's how we, that's how we draw circles. We do fill circle. 
that's how we do um, text. So we give it a position like an X and a Y. We give it the string. We pass in a color. Oh, we've got a new subscriber. Thanks, Cohen. We have a TFT, which is the background color. We want it to be white. We have the size of the text. It's not the background, sorry, the color of the text. We have the size, one, two, or three. No wrap means that it doesn't wrap around um, the screen. It just goes off the side. Uh, and the font is the system font that we're going to use. So that's uh, so that's how we draw text to the screen. I then got this little function that's called window, which just draws a couple of rectangles. So fill rectangles and rectangles. Fill rectangle just has a, a solid color. Again, you give it an X and a Y, uh, and then a width and a height, and what the color you want it to be. Whereas the, the rectangle that's not filled <clears throat> doesn't have the... Um, it has a colour, but it's just like a, a single width. You can't define how wide the, uh, the rectangle is. And then we have horizontal lines. And you can do vertical lines. They're really just a quicker way of drawing that as well. So that's that. Um, the start message just draws on the screen. Press S to start. So nice and simple. Print menu prints it to the console. So it just does that main menu. S to start, erase game, F to draw frame, and then H to go home. I think it should be G to go home. That's what it was. Drawing the frame. So this is how it actually tells the um, the robot to draw things. So it's quite interesting how this works. So ignore that epoch. That's me trying to debug stuff, but without using um, the breakpoint function. I just print stuff to the screen and see where things happen. So lift pen up. <clears throat> so pen up is that position, which is a value of 70, it's an angle of 70. So it just lifts up the pen. Uh, and it, and uh, we just define a sleep value because we want to use that later on. And then we just define a whole bunch of different things. So vertical line one, vertical line two, horizontal line one and two. That's the, the, the game board, in fact, and they're the coordinates of that. Then we, we say draw two and it will draw that from position 30 to position, uh, sorry, position 30 on the X and position Y on the 10. So wherever it is to that position. Then we just draw um, some horizontal and vertical lines on the screen itself. I also want to draw a little grid out. I was actually thinking that, you know, we could use that rather than drawing to the console, we could draw that out to the screen as well. So we can do that. Then we put the pen down, we draw whatever position we are to 25 and 50. So these are all in millimeters from that um, X, Y, zero or origin position. Um, so you can see that just like pen down, pen up, draw two, and it will go through each of them. You've literally got to go and say which each position is. The go home position basically just says go to the eraser position. So it just lifts the pen up, moves it to the eraser position X, Y, and then puts the pen down. Um, and then, I mean, I created this little function for just squaring a number. I don't even know why I did that because in Python you can, to square a number, if I just want to square the number, um, Say A contained a number, we can just do star star, and that means the squared version of A. So I learned that along the way. The set X and Y is the bit where the real money is. This is all that complicated stuff that I shared earlier. So this is where it's all the trigonometry to work out the two angles the servo needs to be. So Rich is asking a question there. Do the servos work in unison when moving the pen or does it only move one causing the other to be dragged? It uses both of them. So both of them have to be worked in, in coordination to move the, the pen around. Um, if you only had one being moved, um, you wouldn't be able to move to all the positions. So it does require both to be working in unison. So we set both of the the servos here we have left servo and we have right servo and depending on what we put the position in for the x and the y the target x and y will it will figure out what that needs to be for each of those servos uh, the draw two again does a similar kind of thing it uses that floor function it's got some square root stuff going on there uh, make sure that the value is is at least one and not less than one and then for whatever i is uh, in sorry whatever c is which is passed in is it no that's calculated it then um, goes around that many times and that's just basically okay, you want it to when you want it to draw how many steps do you want it to draw in and then we update the the last x and the last y so some of the things i don't like about this code is i'm using global variables which are always like a no-no because it just slows your code down and if you want to change a global variable you have to bring it in by using the global command uh, if you don't do that, any value you change gets thrown away when the, the function is um, finished. 
So if you want to make a change to a global variable, you can read them, which is fine. But if you want to change them, you've got to use global. So that's something uh, to be mindful of. Then there's that return angle that uses that arc cost um, um, function to work out what the arc cost is of this thing here. So this was a, an interesting piece of code. So you're getting, and this is where I've used that star, um, star star for finding the square of a number. So whatever A is and whatever B is, we do A squared plus B, sorry, plus C squared minus B squared divided by two times A times B, A times C. That gets you what you need to for that return angle. That's one of the things I'm like, it's too abstract for me to understand what's going on there. I would much prefer to have the variable names spell out what's going on and maybe a little bit of an explanation so that we can understand there. Lift is dead simple. That just lifts up the, uh, the pen. So there's a whole bunch of things there depending on uh, where the, uh, the pen is. Bogan UZS and Bogan GZS. This must be because the person that wrote the uh, plot clock uh, was Norwegian. So that's probably what that's to do with. Um, and again, it's one of those very interesting, what does that mean? Squee times radius times cosine of start plus count plus BX and the radius of sin. <laughs> I've no idea what's going on there. Um, but that's that's another one of those ones we need to look at. So we've got the draw X. So that draws the X shape. We have a draw zero, which draws the zero. We have erase, which goes and just tells it to position the, the pen in a sort of zigzag position to sort of scrub across. We've got two functions for recording um, and drawing the move. So drawing the move will, um, you you provide a move like position number nine on the, on the board and it will say, right, draw X. And then these are the actual coordinates for each of those possible positions. So you can see there, there's quite a few of them. Um, okay, and there's, the reason there's more than nine moves is because you also want it to draw the winning line and you've got three columns, three rows and two diagonals. So it needs some extra ones for that too. Recording the move is just so you can record in that little empty places and update the board value. Sorry, update the empty places and update the board values with what's been played. So again, we have to use that global variable, which is just ugly. There's probably a better way we can do that with a class, I think. Draw is just, if there is a draw, I just want it to say on the little um, SPI screen that it, there's a draw, nobody won. That's all that does. Player wins, this just draws to the screen that the player has won. Uh, Pico Tico wins, it does the same thing there. It just says, here's some text on the screen. Pico wins and draws it to the console as well. And then there's a couple of things to check if you won on a column, you won on a row, or you've won on the diagonals. So that's what those are to do with. The reply move is, um, what's that to do with? So we're just finding an empty space. So yeah, it's basically just the robot picking um, a position it wants to play on the board. That's currently just picking a random number. Um, if we want to make that more interesting, we would need to make it so that it isn't just a random number between the range of whatever's in empty places. We put some one of those min-max algorithms in there. Um, so yeah, check when a diagonal, we talked about that. Printing the board is just printing to the console, the little board. So as we were playing, you could see there's a little console version of that as well. Start game um, does exactly what you'd expect. It draws out on the, the TFT screen, the game is on. Um, it prints to the, prints, it, it makes the uh, robot draw out the uh, position of the, the board. And it kind of sets up all the variables as well, depending on whether you've got the serial mode enabled, whether you've got the draw human move or not, and so on. So it's got all the code in there for checking each time has somebody won or not. I don't think that's currently working properly because I win and then it ignores me. <laughs> it's all cheats. So something's probably not quite right in there. Yep. And it's probably to do with this checking N in the range. I think that needs to be a four, not a three, because of the way that that works so that's probably what that's to do with i think when you do a for loop and you use range the number that's the highest number has to be plus one otherwise it's it's one number out is what i think is happening there so that calibrate was just um it enabled me to type in a value so it's just a bit of kind of housekeeping code enter a value and it will just adjust the servo by that amount and it's just a really quick way of sort of in real time testing out does it work or not 
Um, up just lifts the pen up. <laughs> it just looked more elegant to write up uh, on there. Uh, if calibrate, then it just runs a calibrate routine. Uh, draw frame at the very beginning, draws the click start and prints out the menu. So that's pretty much the code. Um, yeah, clear the board just erases the board values and sets them all back to minus one. And then we just reset the game variables. Winner minus one and the empty places equals nine. Cool. So we have another game of it just to sh just to show what what how, how it's working. I know it's not fantastic yet. I'm just really pleased that I've got it working at all, given that um, all the challenges that there were there of um, translating the code, building the robot, um, finding a pen that would work, and all the rest of it, and blowing up servos and whatnot. So let's go back to the the sorry the combi view, and let's load up again. So if I press run. It will then start the program and it will draw out the board. It might be doing that too quickly as well. All those little ticks and everything is because it's like doing it too quickly and it's wobbling about a little bit as well there you can see. So there's, I think I think a few of them just need tightening up again. Let's just do that just to make it a bit better. So I'm just going to hold that under there. That's what I'm doing. I'm just holding the screen in. I don't want them to be too tight because that'll actually ruin the. Um... Let's just do that. The servo horn. What happened on one of the servo horns was this is actually doesn't grip anymore. It's spinning round without actually gripping to the servo, so it's completely smoothed out the inside of that servo horn because I've tightened them too tight. So there's kind of a sweet spot where you want it to be. Right, so I'm now gonna say start the game, S to start. It'll actually draw that board again. There we go, and it's gonna pick the middle one. That That's supposed to be an X. Let's go for, let's just move this console up a bit so we can see what's going on. There we go, so I'm gonna press number three this time, <clears throat> which is that. So it's gone for the bottom one there. So you can see that on the left hand side of the console I've got the current game board and then on the right hand side I've got ID. So that's just a couple of clever print statements and depending what's in the board values because remember the, the board array has minus one, zero or one and I've changed that to be nothing, an X or a zero. So there's a little bit of an F if statement there. Right, I'm gonna go for number six, try and get that win across the top. I should have changed that code on the range. Um, Let's go for number nine. That should win because I've got my zeros, but because it's not, let's change that code actually and see if that will actually work. So if I just find that range function, and let me just change that to be, there we go, one to four. Let's try and change that. Let's change that as well. Okay, so I'm going to save that. that. That won't work for this particular game. I'm going to have to let it win, so it doesn't matter which one. I... <clears throat> I don't think it matters which I pick. <clears throat> Let's try number two. <coughs> there we go. Okay. <clears throat> Me. <clears throat> fixed it. Sorry about that, I've got a really dry throat. It's for some reason it's just <clears throat> really, really affected me there, so I can't even breathe properly. But obviously talking too much. <laughs> <clears throat> I should have water rather than coke as well, I think. <clears throat> 
sorry about that. I've got red eyes and everything. So that fixed it. That worked. Um, I changed the code to make it so that it didn't go from one to three. It goes from one to four. I can show you that on the screen. <clears throat> Let's go for, go for that view there. So there's only a couple of places in the code which actually have the range functions. So if I just do the uh, find, oops. Sorry, I'm all over the place here. There we go, range. If I just scroll down. So here it is. <clears throat> so this is in the uh, the function which checks the the game, I think. Yeah, check the winner. And it was going from one to three, and it should go from one to four, not one to three. And, then, and again, further down, there's another one that checks between one and three. <clears throat> it needs to be one and four. Because that wasn't working properly, it wasn't checking the last column or the last row. And therefore, it was it was thinking that the, the, the game hadn't been won. So I fixed that. And that's working fine. So, phew. <laughs> so let's have a look if there's any comments and uh, let's see what people have been talking about. And you can help me out because I'm dying here. <laughs> okay, so. So Richard says, I need a robotic sweet dispenser. I think I absolutely do. Um, we've got Trek Troublemaker on there as well. And uh, Hybot says, always have a proper secondary power supply for servos and motors. Nine volt, nine volt batteries do not work. Absolutely. <clears throat> and, I, and I learned that to my cost by... Put in a nine volt battery on and just having the magic smoke come up. Um, then Richard says, um, should should have named the code Joshua, referring to the classic game. Do you want to play a game of chess? I remember that from, uh, if you've not seen War Games, you have to watch that. I think Matthew Broderick's in, isn't he? One of the first films that he did from uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. So Hypothet says, also make sure the ground for the circuits are connected. Right, so this is where I think the, the issue might be. So when I have my power supply, um, because you, you'd think that grounds are all equal. If everything's, you know, plugged into the mains, it would all be equally grounded. But you can have different ranges of grounds, can't you? So it can be to do with that. Also, you're checking a proper, proper voltage. So I do have a multimeter. And I checked exactly that. So I have a, a multimeter here. It's a nice fancy one. that um, It actually lights up the... Uh, I don't know if you can see that on there. They're actually lit up there. And as I plug in, it's as if to say, depending on what function you've chosen there, if I turn that off, you'll see they go out. Um, it lights them up to say you need to plug in the, the common ground into the common ground, and then that colour goes out. And then you can plug that one into, into there, like so. And you can even remove these like things off the top so you've got more of a, um, a stabby thing to connect your wires to. So yes, I did that, and... Um, so I get my little nine volt battery there. Let's set this to to be detecting that. And if I just stab this in here, I think that is that's plus and that's minus. So if I stab them in there, I should get about eight, eight to nine volts showing up on there. You got nine point three four. It's a nice big, powerful battery that can burn out MG ninety. So yes, you definitely need one of them in your toolkit. Um, if you've not got one, I have got a, a much cheaper one, but this is um, one I spent a little bit more money on. Nice and robust. Um, so why are the two triangles different? So the reason the two triangles are different is depending on where the game board, the the, the pen is going to be, there will be different triangles. So one is, um, I can just show this while it stays together. So if I've got um, these here, so this is the left servo and this is the right servo. So if I just turn that one there, you can see it's moving over that way, but the so it's kind of drawing an arc. Now, if I want that to go to the other side, I have to then turn that one. So using them in unison, if I if I made them go exactly the same, it will draw a straight line up and down. But to draw a, a line, you need to sort of turn both of them and turn them different amounts depending on. You think they can only turn in an arc, so to, to actually draw a straight line, it, <coughs> excuse me, it's continuous adjustment to make sure that it is straight. So, um, yeah, it takes quite a bit of getting your head around that. So, um, it is Dale, isn't it? Dale's asking, um, are you keeping code in the repo? So, yes, if you go over to um, github.com slash kevmaclear slash pico-tico, you'll find the code there. 
And Richard is confirming there as well that um, math is generally, maths is UK, math is generally US. Um, so Richard's saying, do they work in unison or do you need to have one and drag the other? They definitely do need to work in unison. Uh, and Jean-Michel um, Jean is saying, uh, I have to go and we'll catch up the replay. Your videos are great. Thank you. Thank you for saying so. That really does make a difference. Um, so I'm going to go and uh, die peacefully in the corner, I think. Um, I've just got a really terrible case of dry dry throat going on there. I have had a cold for the past uh, couple of days, so uh, that's clearly catching up with him a little bit. But hope you've enjoyed this one. I am going to carry on working on this robot. Normally I work on a project and then that kind of put that to a side and then work on something completely different. But I love this so much. I want it to write out different messages on the little board and um, draw pictures as well. I was thinking about how could we get it to like you know convert a, any picture that we put in there to be like lines and stuff. But maybe we could use Illustrator to uh, to get it to draw pictures. I'm thinking like a Bob Ross type picture, but obviously not Bob Ross because that's copyrighted to the uh, the Bob Ross Foundation or whatever it's called. It'll be uh, Robot Ross or something like that instead. <laughs> So thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video uh, and I shall see you all next time. Thanks everybody. See you next time.